This episode is brought to you by Levitt Pavilion. This summer, check out one of my favorite outdoor concert venues in Denver, Levitt Pavilion. May through October, Levitt is offering ticketed and totally free all-ages concerts. I feel like we just go to anything that's free because it's like the kids can be at the show and it's people aren't weird about it and you can like bring a picnic. It's awesome. Some of the free shows this season include Is Kali, Melvin Seals, War and Treaty, Sunny War, Chali Tuna, and more. To RSVP for free shows and buy tickets, plus see the full concert schedule, go to levittdenver.org. That's levittdenver.org. Today on CityCast Denver. The U.S. Department of Justice announced last week that the DEA will be moving forward with plans to reschedule cannabis from a Schedule 1 to a Schedule 3 controlled substance. But what does that mean in a state where weed has been legal for 10 years? We talked to trailblazing former cannabis journalist and founder of Grasslands Cannabis PR agency, Ricardo Baca, to learn more. Today is Monday, May 6th. I'm Bree Davies, and here's what Denver's talking about. So, Ricardo, what would it mean for the DEA to reschedule cannabis? You know, it is kind of this incremental move toward federal legalization. It's kind of this gray area move, but it's it's necessary because we we're never going to see a a modern president just straight up go out and say, "Hey, let's legalize weed federally." This is really the incremental process the industry has been anticipating, and so um, it means that we're moving in the right direction. And technically, what we just heard about this week from DEA, this is the most significant drug policy shift in our lifetime for American drug policy. This is really transformative. Well, so you're saying incremental, but this is also transformative. Are you saying like this bigger process is or this particular thing, this rescheduling? Yeah, this particular thing of rescheduling, believe it or not, it can be incremental and historic in a way. You know, you have a modern cannabis industry that very much wants to be treated differently because Schedule 1, you know, Schedule 1 on the Controlled Substances Act means that there's no medicinal value and there's a high potential for abuse. And for most people who have consumed cannabis, they recognize that's just not the case. And so it doesn't belong to be classified alongside heroin. And now a schedule three, if this goes through, assuming it will, and now it looks like it will because of this recent DEA news, it's more classified along the side other pharmaceuticals, including ketamine. So it's better than schedule one, but the industry feels very strongly that it should be descheduled entirely. You think about it, alcohol, nicotine, both descheduled Those are substances. De-scheduled. Okay. And alcohol kills more than 70,000 American adults a year. You know, this is a non-toxic plant. So I think there's been a lot of an inconsistency with U.S. drug policy reform, primarily as a result of this war on drugs. So this is an incremental step to where we need to get, but it is still huge as far as U.S. drug policy goes. I like that you clarified, though, descheduling means it would become something like alcohol or cigarettes, which are legal. What does that mean to go from a Schedule 1 to a Schedule 3? It means that this is the first time the federal government is acknowledging the medical efficacy of cannabis. You know, Schedule 1 means, again, it's it, there is no medical efficacy and there's a high potential for abuse. As you go down the scheduling into 3, 4, and 5, it means there's less potential for abuse. And these are proven medicines, which we know from research over the last decade, including from some of the most stringent medical authorities in the world, like JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, as well as the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, weed is medicine for certain conditions, you know, for for chronic pain, for intractable epilepsy, and a couple others. Weed is a legitimate medicine. And now the federal government is kind of catching up to the research and the science. Maybe it's the catching up aspect, but you said like no American president would just legalize it, but doctors are behind this, scientists, there's data to back it up. Why don't you think a president could make that decision for the country? From what I understand, it's primarily about the use of political capital. Uh, you know, it's like, is is President Biden going to actually step up to the podium and and really take the first and foremost, I want to federally legalize weed? No, he's got more important things to do. But really, this is, of course, also a tool. 
Biden has a complex history with criminal justice reform, right? And and for the most of his career, he's been very much on the wrong side of history. He's said very much that this is him trying to get it right. He has been wrong in the past, but now he's doing it his own way uh, because he's an institutionalist. This is the incremental way to get to federal legality and to get to descheduled cannabis. And and it's classic Biden that he's going about doing it this way. Not a surprise. And 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 frankly, I think most of the industry sees this as a huge win. And it'll be interesting to see how the next few steps go, including this public comment period. You mentioned this too, the sort of justice. That, that that aspect of it, of making it legal and decriminalizing it, essentially, does rescheduling change any of that for folks who may be caught up in the system because of things like marijuana? It might change things on a more minute level, but this does not change the legality of cannabis federally. It's still a federally illegal substance that has been legalized across most states for adult use. We're, you know, now a significant portion, a majority of American adults have access to legal weed. So um, I want to share something that G- Governor Jared Polis said. Um, he sounds excited, but I don't totally understand. He said, quote, we look forward to when Colorado businesses will continue to safely fulfill the consumer demand without facing additional safety challenges and unnecessary financial burden that 280E tax provisions created. What does that mean? You touched on the big <laughs> part, Bree. So, so it's super boring, but 280E is one of the biggest headaches for any plant touching business in the industry. Plant touching meaning they have a license, they're growing, manufacturing, retailing. Um, and what it ultimately means is that plant touching businesses in cannabis pay a tax rate that's twice the amount that any other business out there pays. My business, Grasslands, we're a PR agency. We pay an effective tax rate between 30, 35%. That means the grower, the retailer, they pay an effective tax rate that's 60 to 70 percent because they can't write off cost of goods sold and normal elements of just doing business. And this is an old anti-racketeering law. This is Al Capone era. But we are technically dealing in a federally illegal uh, substance. This is trafficking, you know. So so that's what 280E is. And that's one of the biggest advantages for the industry is to uh, Schedule 3 gets rid of 280E, which is why uh, this is so historic. I think there has long been um, misinformation thinking, oh, you're in weed, you're making money hand over fist. That has never been the case, (laughs) especially (laughs) since, you know, the first three months of the regulated market in any uh, place it goes legal, uh, primarily because of 280E. And that's what Polis is referencing. So this like a 60% tax rate is, is crazy. If that could change, does that mean like cannabis for the consumer could get cheaper? It does mean yeah, absolutely. And it's hard to th- even think about that, right? Because if, if for consumers who are buying on a consistent basis, they have seen cannabis get cheaper and cheaper since the dawn of adult use back on January 1st, 2014. Um, you now can walk out the door for an ounce of weed for, uh, you know, 60, 70 bucks sometimes because prices have plummeted. But yeah, technically, it could get cheaper for consumers, without a doubt. Um, more realistically, it just makes doing business in this space more realistic because right now it is very unrealistic and that financial burden that Governor Polis mentioned, it really just makes doing business in this industry nearly impossible, which is why we've seen so much attrition attrition in the Colorado market. Do you think that this could bring new folks into them? You know, maybe more mom and pops, because I know that we've lost quite a few because bigger businesses come in and, and purchase these smaller dispensaries or grows and things like that. It certainly opens up the opportunity for that. I, th- I, would, I would argue that like for the mom and pops who are still there fighting the good fight, this makes their life significantly easier. Uh, you know, even a single state, single um, licensed business, they stand to save hundreds of thousands of dollars a year if not more, if not getting into the million plus figures. So people who own multiple licenses, uh, the organizations that are operating across multiple states, they stand to save significantly more. It makes it a lot more doable and it does make it a more appetizing space for people looking to get into it because we did have that sexiness and the allure in the early days of the regulated market. Oh my gosh, I got a, I got a license. I'm going to open up this processing facility and make edibles or concentrates. Uh, And now people don't have that desire because they're seeing uh, the industry truly struggle. They're seeing 
entrepreneurs uh, get their butts kicked across the board, in part because the level field, the playing field is not level, and this will help make it a lot more level. So these businesses actually have the same rights and are treated the same way as others. This episode is brought to you by the Colorado Wine Board. Because the wine community here is like surprisingly robust. I mean, think about Bigsby's Folly and Infinite Monkey Theorem here in Denver alone. And there are urban wineries all across the Front Range. Then there's the Western Slope, Peonia, I mean, Palisade. Hello, Palisade Wine, are you kidding me? It didn't used to really be a thing, but from what I hear, it's very much a thing now. There are more than 165 wineries across Colorado to explore, and they produce all sorts of wine that reflect our unique culture and climate. So finding a label that you're going to love is easy, no matter where your adventure takes you. Discover it for yourself and support local winemakers at coloradowine.com. That's coloradowine.com. This episode is brought to you by the Denver Botanic Gardens. It's time for the 75th annual spring plant sale at the Denver Botanic Gardens. Mark your calendars for Friday and Saturday, May 10th and 11th. Admission is free, but you must register in advance at botanicgardens.org. Registering my husband, Greg, right now for the plants I want him to pick out and plant in our yard for me. Shop from 15 different plant divisions, including annuals, house plants, herbs and veggies, and specialties like aquatics, container garden in a bag, and plants grown right at the gardens. The garden's horticulture staff will be on site to answer any and all plant questions you may have. This sale emphasizes water smart and native plants that are perfect for our semi-arid climate. They'll be great for a beautiful landscape that doesn't require a bunch of water. For more details, registration information, and a catalog of available plants, go to botanicgardens.org. That's botanicgardens.org. So the last time you were on the show a couple years ago, we talked about the post-pandemic slump in Mm. cannabis sales across Colorado. Sales have continued to drop. Is there any reason to expect that rescheduling cannabis on a federal level will help the local industry maybe be more profitable? Definitely. Okay. Oh, undoubtedly. That's the thing. So, uh, you know, those license holding brands, the plant touching businesses, once this goes into effect, which we don't know, very likely uh, we're talking 2025 sometime. Once this goes into effect, they will immediately have a significantly bigger margin than they did previously because of 280E going away. So yeah, this will help these businesses. And it is a much needed lifeline because it's crazy to think that's the last time we chatted. Uh, the post pandemic slump has not stopped. Yeah. We have seen those continued losses and and it has been really horrifying. It's been a bloodbath in Colorado and California and other m- more mature regulated markets. You know, we're seeing, of course, when Jersey and New York, they're coming online right now and there's so much optimism and it's great to see that they have their challenges, but they will also encounter similar slumps because we just see this happening in every single market where legalization goes because when you think about it, we're dealing with this patchwork of state by state regulations. And so no other industry is doing it this way. It's horribly awkward. It's terrible. What what is grown in Colorado must be processed and sold in Colorado alone. And so this industry is just facing ridiculous restrictions uh, that makes it impossible to, to really turn a profit. But once they can get this profit margin back from 280E, then at least it makes everything else a little bit more doable. More affordable. Okay. So speaking of money, will this change any of the sort of banking issues that legal cannabis businesses face? I mean, I know it's just they can't operate like any other, like a liquor store, for instance. Right. Uh, Cannabis uh, organizations still do not have access to traditional bank services. So that includes loans. You know, that is the when when people talk about the, the insane barriers to entry to get involved in the modern cannabis market, that's because you can't go to your local bank and take out a loan to start a dispensary. And these barriers to entry are are very real. So yeah, without a doubt. Is there anything else that the the local like cannabis businesses could expect from this new federal designation? Anything else we haven't because I feel like we've touched on so many aspects of it already, but There are other elements. You know, the hope is that this rescheduling effort will eventually lead to a safe banking passage. There's a bill that's been in D.C., um, I believe, 
almost every year for the last decade. It's known as Safe Banking or Safer Banking Act. And we're hoping that that will pass, which will give the access to the banking. Um, but other ways that it'll impact local businesses here in Denver and Colorado, uh, this opens up access to research pretty significantly. So brief story, my friend Sue Sicily, she's a cannabis researcher out of Arizona. And both Sue and I sit on Governor Polis's Natural Medicine Advisory Board, where we're steering psychedelic <laughs> policy. Um, Sue, to do research on cannabis, she had to get a special license from the DEA. And then once it came to securing the study drug, she had to secure it from a farm on the University of Mississippi campus, which has a contract with U.S. federal government, meaning she couldn't go to the dispensary across the street where she lives in Scottsdale and Phoenix and get the actual weed that people are consuming every day. Uh, that's what Schedule 1 means. So when we go down to Schedule 3, suddenly it opens up research significantly. And that means we're going to learn a lot more about this substance that we still are so generally unfamiliar with. The good, the bad, what are the risks? Let's dive deeper into that. But also let's dive deeper into the medical efficacy to recognize what is this useful for from that medical purpose, but also wellness. I mean, walk into any dispensary, a majority of the edibles you're going to see on any shelf are are dedicated to sleep. These are helping people sleep. My my 86-year-old mom consumes weed every night. She's never really been 